Hi, Scott. I really appreciate you being available today to talk about your writing practice and uh, your work at the Phoenix Center and anything else that comes up. Is there anything you'd like to say before we get started? Dive into our interview. No, Penn, I'm just uh, excited to be with you to talk about writing. I, I um, it's become a big part of my life in the past couple of years, and I find it sometimes sometimes hard to find people who are as excited as I am about writing. Well, I have a huge batch of students that would love to hear about your journey and your process. So, when did you first start to actually love writing? Assuming that you do. Wait, do you not love writing? <laughs> I would say now I love writing, but I didn't <laughs> always. Um, actually for a while really hated writing and, and didn't find any enjoyment out of it especially like the kind of forced writing in undergrad and grad school even um i think it was my last year of my master's program is where things started to shift for me and i would say it really was largely because of uh two mentors i had one was a social work professor at, at the school at Bryn Mawr College. Um, her name was Cindy Sousa. And I had written a paper for her class and I just was so excited about the content. And it was like, it was a paper about all the privatized systems uh, that folks with substance use disorder interact with and how those systems can be really dehumanizing for them. And I got really into it, and it was clear I was going to go way over the page limit for the assignment, <laughs> but I was so warmed up and into it and learning and just excited about the content and writing and what I was discovering. And Cindy gave me um, permission to, you know, go way beyond the page limit and follow, you know, my excitement with it and encourage me to later submit it for publication. Um, so that was one turning point. And at about the same time, I was at a psychodrama conference. I don't remember which conference it was, but I ran into um, Adam Blattner, who's a psychodramatist. Um, uh, he was based in, out of Texas. Now I think he's in California. And he's like the writing cheerleader in the psychodrama community, from what I hear. Uh -huh over the years encouraging everyone to write and it was my first just kind of informal encounter with him in the hallway and you know i said hi adam i'm scott i've read your books and his one of the first things he said to me was do you write <laughs> i said no i've never i mean i write for my assignments in class but i've never published anything and he says uh well, tell me this, Scott, have you ever had a novel idea? An idea that was your own, something that, you know, maybe no one else has thought of before. And before I could, you know, um, insecurely say, yeah, maybe <laughs> I've had a novel idea. <laughs> he cut me off and said, write, <laughs> write about it. <laughs> the world needs new ideas. The world Aww. needs to hear especially in the psychodrama community where there isn't as much writing and publishing going on. Um, and he really encouraged me to write. And then he, he framed writing through Moreno's canon of creativity, um, which I think you may have been at a training with me yeah. on the, yeah, I thought I'm so. Familiar. So the, for folks who aren't familiar, the canon of creativity is psychodrama's um, theory of change. It's a map for change. And it basically depicts this warming up process we go through. And that at some point in the warming up process, we tap into a spark of spontaneity. The energy for um, producing something new, a new response, a new idea. And that spontaneity is met with creativity and this new idea or new publication or new book is produced. And then once something's created, it becomes part of the cultural conserve, which is 
everything that's been created already. And then we continue our warm up, you know, having a new foundation to warm up from. There's there's a new thing that was added to the cultural conserve. Um, so framing writing through that made sense to me as a psychodramatist and helped me consider um, like working through writer's block and working through resistance to writing by focusing on, well, let me, let me consider how I warm up to writing. That was a major piece for me. Mm -hmm. And then also tying it into Moreno's existential and spiritual philosophy where um, Moreno says that the closest we get to being God is when we create something new. And just framing writing as an act of creation shifted something inside of me existentially. Mm -hmm. And it, it made writing, which previously felt really boring and forced, it made it feel more exciting and meaningful and even spiritual in a sense, like giving birth to something that doesn't exist prior. Um, so yeah, I definitely didn't always love writing and, and it's just in the past three years, really, maybe four years at this point that I've, I've fallen in love with it. Awesome. Well, I think you covered all the content for the interview. So <laughs> just... We can just end here. <laughs> <laughs> the next question I had was, what do you love about it? Which you sort of already touched on, but is there anything you want to deepen into? Um, I guess I would add to, as a social worker, as a clinical social worker, where most of my work is working with clients directly um, and trying to find ways of bridging the gap between macro work, community work, and my clinical work. I found in some ways writing is macro social work. Mm. It's, it has the potential of creating change on a larger scale. Mm. And so um, thinking about writing and publishing, especially doing research, research that could potentially change, um, change the field or change the way we think about interventions or ideas or programs, started to think about it as macro social work in that it, it's it, it, hopefully <laughs> creating change on a larger <laughs> scale. <laughs> we can hope. <laughs> so that's another piece that that excites me about it. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I have some process questions for you here before we dive into more of your experience writing for publication and academic writing that might, I think might be helpful for others to learn from. But where do you like to write? Would you, you want to just talk about your process of warming up to writing, actually? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, since getting a puppy, like everything in my home is, is different. <laughs> so uh -huh. My writing is very different now and much more interrupted and, and um, less consistent. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I kind of have maybe three primary places that I write. One is in my basement office here where I have, you know, a space that's just to myself that I can, uh, it, I really created it as my dissertation den when I was in my mm, doctorate program. Love it, yeah. Like a space that no one else was gonna move things around, a space where I could spread out all the books and leave them open to the pages I was quoting or mm. referencing from. Uh, a space that would allow me to more easily warm up to writing and have everything I need right here. Um, the, the other place I, my favorite place to write really is on the back porch in the sun. Um, something about just sitting out on the deck with the iced coffee, it, mostly in the summer when it's uh, <laughs> not freezing in Philly here. <laughs> and 
there's just something really relaxing about it. You know, it, um, there's, you know, the wind and the trees and the birds and, and, you know, having a little bit of privacy on the back deck. Um, I would say that's my favorite place to write. Um, and then not anymore, but previously I used to travel a lot and I loved writing on the airplane. It was mm -hmm. like, especially long international trips, I would get really excited about like a 16 hour flight from, <laughs> you know, wherever China to New York, because I would have 16 hours where no one can call me, no one can email me, nobody can text me, just my laptop, me and my thoughts and ideas. And so I, I did a lot of writing when I traveled. Um, you know, with the pandemic, I'm not traveling at all. So, so most of my writing is happening, um, you know, at my desk here. Mm -hmm. um, I think Have that you considered getting um, like a airplane set to write inside <laughs> of. <laughs> Like a model airplane that I could <laughs> put my phone on airplane mode. Yeah, especially putting your phone on airplane mode, yeah. I haven't considered it, but <laughs> as a psychodramatist, it gives me another idea. I could just imagine that I'm in an airplane and block out the rest of the world. There's like some babies, some really small glass of water. Yeah, I could see if, if uh, someone will bring me dinner, <laughs> Uber Eats, I guess. <laughs> I love it. That's really fun. <laughs> well, that leads me to our next question is, um, what is it like when you're totally in your writing flow in or out of an airplane? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I guess when I'm like totally in the zone writing, yeah, I can really give myself to it and, and get lost in it to the point where, you know, I can do a really good job of blocking everything else out and just being with the writing, just being with my ideas, with the research or with whatever I'm working on. And it's hard to explain. Maybe it's it's like a spontaneity state mm -hmm. where I'm 100% <laughs> devoted to what I'm doing. I'm not thinking about what am I going to make for dinner? I'm not thinking about, you know, what do I have to do for work tomorrow? I'm not checking emails or looking at my phone. I'm just a hundred percent in what I'm doing and, and creating. I, yeah. I, I think of writing as art making like that kind of feeling when you're totally immersed in almost like a meditative state, Yeah. but a little more active cognitively because you, you know, you're writing something uh, about ideas, something intellectual. Um, and I find for me, I work a lot better when I have longer chunks of time to write. I could get 10 times more work done writing in an eight hour chunk of time than like taking four two hour periods mm -hmm. of time or taking eight yeah. one hour periods. Maybe it's warm up related. I think so. Yeah. It's like, it takes some time to warm up to writing. If I'm coming from, you know, doing something else, um, especially academic writing, I find like <laughs> just to get to a place where I have like the dozen tabs open on the browser with <laughs> all the different references and all the different books on the, and I'm just mentally into that space and, and into the more complicated ideas that come with academic writing. It can take me a half hour just to warm up. Right. And maybe a half hour, you know, reviewing what I already wrote so that I can add on to it in a coherent way. Mm -hmm. So it, it might be an hour before I actually am warmed up to start adding anything new to the paper. And so it, it makes sense why having a long period of time to write works better for me. Mm -hmm. um, what I was doing for a while, partially for my own self-care and sanity, as a trauma therapist, I just can't 
do trauma therapy all day every day it's too mm -hmm. taxing why not <laughs> yeah. yeah there's this thing called burnout and vicarious trauma oh, i don't know anything about that <laughs> <laughs> you might be in denial <laughs> um and maybe part of it is as an introvert i find writing to be very soothing and it's much more left brain oriented than like doing therapy which is much more emotional and right brain relational right brain oriented so for you know pre-pandemic i was intentionally scheduling every friday or at least half of the day friday no clients no sessions no meetings it was scheduled writing time where i would sit on the back deck and write and it was you know it, it was writing and work related and it it really helped with self-care and balance i find there's a way that um writing helps me integrate things and make sense of um some of my clinical work that can be really emotionally overwhelming at times, you know, working with trauma all the time. Yeah. Um, and so even though I'm writing about trauma therapy, most of the time, it's kind of approaching it from a different angle, mm -hmm. uh, which feels different and helps, helps me think about my clinical work differently too. It's yeah, like, it's like all the roles feed each other and support each other. Climbing into that observational ego exactly yep it's a good ladder for that yeah yeah it's like getting a, a bit more distance from it in that observing ego role you mentioned mm -hmm. and and i find balance perspective insight new awarenesses from that place yeah great so i feel like there's some some tips already which is about like the the writing space being crucial and then for you having longer chunks budgeted so that the warm up, which kind of takes a significant amount of energy to organize, especially if you're not completely aware of what your warm up is yet, but that that can happen and then allow for more time where there's the, the depth encounter happening. But so do you feel like there are any other things that are critical to your warm up? You've got, so you've got the setting up your space. Yeah. And then the opening the tabs, getting into the tab nightmare, the Google <laughs> Chrome tab nightmare, opening yeah. the books, reviewing old materials. Is there anything else that creates that state of creative vitality for you? Um, I, I think what I do just kind of naturally is envision what the final product might look like or the impact it could have in the field or in uh, in the world. And so like having not it's never a fully defined vision, mm -hmm. but like when I'm working on say a research publication that's like grueling and sometimes painful to write <laughs> with all the data and, and you know, all, all that kind of stuff, I would, I find myself constantly revisiting this vision of this is going to be a meaningful contribution to the field mm. this could inform uh the way we practice clinically this could inform policy this is going to be a good marketing tool because it it shows the effectiveness of some of the approaches that i use and that we use in programs that i work in and so thinking about like on a larger scale, what impact is this publication going to have? Either uh, impact for, you know, clients, if I'm writing a client handout or a blog post, what impact is this publication going to have on students or trainees? Um, or if it's a research publication, what impact could this have within the larger field? Yeah. And you know, just returning to that vision, it's almost like it, it gives us a little bit of a, like a dopamine hit or something mm -hmm. that drives, helps drive me towards it mm -hmm. and tap into the motivation to, to do the tough work that, that's involved with writing. Yeah, like 
sort of opening to an audience that you're going to re be received by well or something you know yeah okay. yeah like, like considering you, considering the audience and, and how this could impact yeah but then taking it like to the next level of considering and creating an audience that will benefit <laughs> <laughs> right yeah and that's that's another major piece of the writing process is is of course knowing who we're writing for Mm. which may change from from publication to publication um and i think we'll we'll circle back to that idea when we start talking about you know choosing a journal uh to publish in for academic articles yeah. which really relates to writing for a specific audience um I, I often like to describe us as having to be multilingual in the sense of translating ideas based on the audience, especially when we're writing. Like if I'm writing a client handout about trauma therapy, I'm gonna write it pretty different than if I'm writing a training handout for therapists on trauma therapy, yeah. or if I'm writing a academic article on trauma therapy or research article there are three different audiences yeah and it's like how do we how do i meet the audience where they're at and speak a language that makes the most sense to them totally that's really insightful it's like how do you make the kids movie that's also funny for parents <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah although i think that's even more complicated <laughs> but they do it <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah well we have so many questions here i'm really excited to dive into your technical tips about publishing academically and stuff like that but i just have one more um warm-up if you will about what's your favorite thing that you've written thus far oh well i would have to say my new book of course um i actually just got this in the mail that. yesterday <laughs> so it's coincidental that we scheduled this today. <laughs> but it wasn't planned like that either. <laughs> sure. No, I'm just kidding. It wasn't. <laughs> so that okay. right now, that would definitely be my favorite thing that I've written. It, um, it was probably two years in the making. It started as an idea for my dissertation. Mm. And then through my literature review, in the dissertation writing process, realizing how there was this huge gap in the literature and very few people had written about the intersections between the social work field and Moreno's methods. Mm. Even though there, there's tons of social workers who are certified as psychodramatists and practicing mm. psychodramatists, very few people had written about the theoretical and philosophical and historical connections and integrations at, at an academic level. Mm -hmm. I think originally I, I found less than a dozen articles and most of them were either from like the fifties or they were in German. Oh wow. And I had to like Google translate them into English to figure out somewhat what they were talking about. So this book idea started as my dissertation. And then when I finished the dissertation, I, I took that and used it as a foundation to write the book, um, which honestly wouldn't have been possible if it hadn't have been for the pandemic. Um, because I had gotten so busy, uh, it, it was hard to find time to write. And it was interesting, just a week or two before the pandemic really broke out, I found myself saying, it would be great if I could just take a week or two or three or a month off just to write, because I'm really warmed up to writing this book. And then all of a sudden, the coronavirus pandemic came and and I, being self-employed and, and you know not, not uh, being an employee anywhere, I lost most of my contracts overnight and went from like 50 hours of work a week to like 10 or 15 hours of work a week. Nice. Which gave me tons of time to write. And this is kind of the manifestation of, 
of me trying to make the best of my time during the pandemic, you know, before things picked up again. Right. Um, so definitely my favorite piece of writing. Awesome. Do you want to tell us again what the title oh. is? Yeah. So the book is called uh, Social Work, Sociometry and Psychodrama, Experiential Approaches for Group Therapists, Community Leaders, and Social Workers. And so it's, um, I wrote it somewhat as a textbook for the psychodrama course I teach at Bryn Mawr College's social work program. But I also wrote it really intentionally in a way that um, it would be of interest to academics or researchers, but also to practitioners. And so, you know, oh, there's a lot of research and references and citations and theory and history in the beginning sections. And then the later sections are uh, really devoted to practice. So there's five chapters about using sociometry and, and psychodrama in group work. There's a, a section with two chapters about using these methods in individual work. Then there's two chapters on using these methods in community work and activism. Awesome. And then there's a, a final chapter that looks at how these methods can be modified for uh, supervision or for education, how they can be used as experiential education tools. So it's, there's like a lot crammed into this book that, you know, different sections might be more interesting to different professionals. Um, and it's also published open access, which means oh, awesome. um, you can get the entire ebook for free online. So um, I encourage, we'll put the link in the description to the video here. Uh, you don't need to buy it. You can get the whole thing for free. Um, so and the publisher sells physical copies. And it sounds like you answered your question of speaking to being multilingual to multiple audiences, chapter books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good answer. point. That's one answer. That's a good point. I didn't even think of it in that way, but you're right. That it's helps. like even within the same publication we can attempt to be multilingual and speak to multiple different groups of people yeah are you saying my book is kind of like a children's movie that i may different? have alluded to a joke <laughs> like that yeah maybe so <laughs> well we've got a few different um types of publications we were going to talk about but maybe since we're already on the book do you want to just sort of give us an overview of what your process was like or what a process could be like for uh, developing a manuscript or something like that for a book specifically? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, so I, my experience with it, um, and it could be a little bit different depending on, you know, different fields and different publishers. Um, and this book was published within a book series so the process will probably be slightly different because it was part of a book series. I hope that I have a bit of a dual role because I'm also a co-editor for the book series. So I knew of the book series as it was coming out. Um, I initially didn't have a plan of contributing a book to the book series. Um, and that, that came later. So, you know, finding a book series that relates to the, the content you're writing about probably makes it easier and more attractive for a, a publisher to accept your proposed book because it fits within a book series that, that they're already publishing. Um, the, there was a formal proposal process um, that involved, you know, providing all the details about the book, the outline, table of contents, um, the book audience, and like adding in some marketing material about the book. So it, it almost requires us as writers to reverse roles with the publisher for a little bit who are running a business and have to consider how can this, how can I write this book in a way that is also appealing to the publisher? So they're, they're another sub audience in some ways. Right. Um, because they need to be able to sell the book if they're gonna 
invest in publishing it, of course. So the book proposal includes some marketing um, information, the content of the book, and then the book proposal I did required me to include at least two chapters. So I had to have two chapters already completed. And so I sent that in. And because this is an academic book and an academic book series, the proposal had to be peer reviewed by experts in the field. So this might be something that's that's different for different types of books. If you're writing fiction or or you know writing outside of the academic world, they're probably not peer reviewing. They're definitely not peer reviewing in the same way that they would be for an academic publication. Um, so the peer reviewers read the proposal, comment on it, send the comments to the publisher and the editor at the publisher who, you know, they also have their own meetings considering the proposal. And then all that information gets sent back to me as the author who submitted the proposal. And, you know, of course they accepted it and, and offered recommendations for um, the scope of the book, offered suggested changes in relationship to the title or chapter titles. Um, they gave a little bit of guidance and direction on, on how to write the book. Nothing that dramatically changed what I was already envisioning, um, but, but simple things that, that ultimately were helpful. Yeah. And then, then it's on, you know, on to signing a contract and following through with the terms of the contract, getting a manuscript to the publisher by the deadline. And then because it's an academic book, the entire book manuscript has to be peer reviewed again. So the publisher has to find two experts in the field who can peer review the entire book and give feedback. Then that comes back to me as the author with su suggested revisions and I make the revisions and submit the final manuscript. And then it goes on to the next phase where they're doing all the formatting, all the copy editing, uh, proofreading, and, and um, any other kind of technical stuff. If there's like videos embedded into the ebook or, or images, those kinds of things. Um, and that process can take some time. Then the publisher sends the final book proofs. And usually they, they give you, you know, so many days to review the book proofs and finalize them and send them back. And at that point, you're not allowed to change anything significant. It's more so um, fixing citations or references that were weren't formatted correctly or catching spelling errors or, you know, making sure all the, the images and figures and tables are all in the right spot. And once you sign off on that, then it goes back to the publisher and, and eventually it's published. Easy so it's, does it. <laughs> easy does it. It's a long process. <laughs> definitely is a long process. Um, so for you, how long was that from initial conception? It sounds like you had your idea as part of your dissertation, but then when you first started working on the manuscript and those two chapters to getting a book in hand yesterday, what was that time <laughs> frame for you? I'm not sure exactly how long it took. I don't have the dates in front of me. I know the idea for the book initially emerged in the dissertation process, which would have been three years ago when I started thinking about that. Um, I, I would say the book proposal, I probably submitted close to a year ago at this point, maybe longer than that. Mm -hmm. You know, the writing, writing the actual book is is the most intensive part for the author yeah that takes the most time mm -hmm. um so that that took you know probably nine nine months a year and that was that's considering i already had a foundation for it from my dissertation because i own the copyrights to my dissertation and can 
republish parts of it or you know take the ideas from it and use them expand upon them in the book which is what i ended up doing um actually initially intended for the book to be largely um republishing pieces of my dissertation just yeah. copy and pasting but once i got into writing <laughs> It was like updating things, new ideas were emerging, and the book is almost entirely new. Almost nothing is is copied and pasted from the dissertation. Um, I think it was in the fall I submitted the final draft. So, you know, that's close to six months from submitting the final draft peer review, revisions, mm -hmm. proofs, formatting, until it, it being published. Um, and even then it's just right now, only the ebook is is published. That was published February 24th. Um, I got the physical copy because I'm the author and they sent me the author copies. Yeah. But the physical versions are, you can pre-order them right now, but they won't be available for a couple more weeks. So it's a it's a long process. It's a big commitment. Yeah. A, a time commitment. It's really a long-term commitment to write a book. Some of that timeline can be shortened if you're self-publishing. Mm -hmm. As there aren't as many steps. And for non-academic books, you know, you can cut out a couple months because you don't have to wait for peer reviewers to read a 450-page book and give comments on it. Yeah. So that'll save some time. Um, I would say an academic book is probably the longest kind of book to write. That would be my guess. Process-wise in terms of completion to publication. Yeah. 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 Are there any other notable nuances that you could touch on between um, self-publishing versus working with a traditional publisher that come to mind? Yeah, I, I think it really depends on what your goal is for the book, who your intended audience is, um, and what type of book you're writing. I don't have direct experience with self-publishing, so I might be biased um, you know, away from it. And especially for an academic book, um, I think publishing with a traditional publisher gives a a book more credibility, especially an academic book. Right. And it allows for it to be peer reviewed. Um, I, I don't think you can have a self-published book peer reviewed. Right. Um, I might be wrong about that, but, mm -hmm. but there would be a conflict of interest and lots, a lot more dull roles <laughs> involved. So I think a traditional publisher helps with credibility for a book if you're mm -hmm. writing it academically. Um, the other benefit for a publisher for me was that all of Springer's academic books are indexed in their academic databases, which are all available for students and researchers and professors when they're using their university credentials to log in and search for, for articles or resources. So it helps disseminate the book content in that, you know, when a student goes on to their university database and is writing a paper about psychodrama and they search the keyword psychodrama, uh, all of my book and all the chapters individually are gonna show up in their search results. Mm. So having it in those academic databases is a big plus. Yeah. And if the book wasn't open access, it would mean that um, students and anyone with academic affiliation would still be able to access the book for free with their login. So that would be a, a big plus that you couldn't really do if you were self-publishing. Right. Um, I think having a traditional publisher, you lose out on potential profits that you might make from the book and you lose some control over the, the content. Um, However, you know, if you just want to be an author and you don't want to have to be an author 
a marketer, an editor, a formatter. <laughs> you don't want to have to do all the behind the scenes stuff. Working with a publisher makes things easier for authors. Right. And that they have teams and departments that handle all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, when you self-publish, the book only goes as far as you market it. Right. So that can be limiting. Um, but there's definitely benefits to self-publishing. You have full control over the content. No one's going to tell you you have to change the title because it doesn't fit with their marketing plan or doesn't fit with their vision for it. Um, and you can shorten the timeline. You know, if you're self-publishing, you can get stuff out into the world much quicker, which may be beneficial, especially in certain circumstances. So it sounds like much, much like other forms of collaboration, you don't have to do the hard work of collaborating, but you also don't get the reward of having help for your journey in some respects. Yeah, that would be a really simplified and, and good way of saying it. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry to oversimplify, but that's what I'm taking away from it. Is the... <laughs> yeah, I found as, you know, this being my, the first book I've written, it was really helpful to work with a team mm. that had years and years of publishing experience and to be able to ask questions that, you know, I, I didn't know how any of this kind of stuff worked. Right. So it's educational if you're also early in your writing career too. You have this group of guides needing you to do specific things. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Pushing you along. <laughs> Right. Though it also seems yeah. that nowadays a lot of information related to self-publishing you can access on YouTube and plenty of people have put out put out guides and, and informational videos or, or blog posts yeah. about how to navigate the nuances of self-publishing too. Mm. That's good to know. Yeah. Great. Well, so we have a few other types of writing listed here that we were going to touch on. Blogs, newsletters, journal and journal articles. Do you want to start with journal articles since there's also a few different kinds of those and then we can narrow out the other ones? Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I, I think, um, well, I know for me, the first time I submitted a journal article, a, a manuscript to a journal, it was like this scary process that was really intimidating that I learned nothing about in school. Uh -huh. And it was like, <laughs> how do I pick which one to submit it to? Am I formatting it right? What's a cover letter supposed to say? Right. Um, you know, how do I, what are kind of the nuances involved with this? Yeah. Um, and honestly, the first article I submitted got rejected multiple times and never has been published. It was the, <laughs> the article I referenced earlier about uh, substance use. Uh, so, you know, you will have articles rejected and that's part of the process. Um, doesn't mean it's a bad article or not worth being published. It might mean that you've targeted the wrong journal to try to submit it to might be the wrong time to submit it to that right. journal. Um, there's so many different academic journals within every discipline and they're all very different. They have different audiences, different standards, um, and, and they often run special editions, mm -hmm. special issues, mm -hmm. which have really um, specific topics. Mm -hmm. What I found is that if you can find a special issue of a journal that fits the article you wrote or are planning to write, mm -hmm. you're probably much more likely to get an article submitted, uh, accepted in a special issue than in a regular, just kind of standard issue. So you're talking about if there's, um, if you can find that a, a special theme is going to be forecast in, in a future or is being forecast as a future edition of the journal. So maybe you could talk a little bit about 
finding out what journals are up to and how do you know when those special themes are fated to arise? Yeah. Um, so I would say what I do is I follow the journals on Facebook or social media if they have pages and a lot of them do and they post calls for paper papers and manuscripts and special issue awesome. announcements on their social media pages. That's helpful. Um, some of them might have email lists that you can join. Um, some journals are connected to other professional organizations. Mm -hmm. Like the, the Journal of Psychodrama, Sociometry, and Group Psychotherapy is published by the American Society of Group Psychotherapy and Psychodrama. Mm -hmm. So being a member of that society means you'll get any announcements from them about the journal as well. Mm, so joining things that haven't been published yet, but things that they might be like calls they're soliciting, things like that. Exactly. Okay, yep. awesome. And the simplest way and most time consuming way is is going to all the web pages of all the journals and they'll list their call for papers, you know, on the home page or on a specific tab. Um I, I Definitely, definitely recommend searching for special issues before choosing which journal you submit to. Even if you've already written something, um, I had an experience uh, last year in the summer where I was writing up a research paper about trauma-focused psychodrama at the treatment center I work at. And, you know, it was a solid research paper, but you know, it wasn't a randomized controlled study. It, it wasn't like a top notch research study. Right. And there was a call for paper in a, a really prestigious psychology journal, the mm -hmm. Frontiers in Psychology. Mm -hmm. And it was a, a call for papers for a special issue on the psychological benefits of drama and the arts. <laughs> And so my co-writer and I, we submitted our manuscript to this special issue and it ultimately got published in this special issue within this prestigious psychology journal that I don't know that we would have gotten it published in otherwise. Mm -hmm. So not all journals are the same in terms of their impact factors, uh, which is literally a score impact factor is a score that all yeah. journals have that rank them based on the amount of um, it, generally the impact they have within their field, mm -hmm. how often they're cited and read. I forget what the exact metrics are. And there's, there's actually a couple different ratings that journals get. One of them is impact factor. Mm -hmm. Um, it's usually based on their performance in the last year or the last five years. So impact factors change over time. Uh, some journals might accept m most submissions and they probably have lower impact factors if they're mm -hmm. accepting most submissions. Right. The most prestigious journals with the highest impact factors, they reject most submissions. <laughs> they might only accept 5% of the articles that are sent to them. And getting a an article published in that journal makes a big difference, especially for an academic, you know, who's working towards tenure. Right. Mm -hmm. um, there's different places you can look for journal rankings and impact factors, which is really important when considering which journal to submit your article to. Um, there's, um, Scopus has a database and they have their own metric, uh, for ranking journals and Google Scholar also has a, a database of journal rankings that they update every five years. Um, and then most journals, just about every journal, they'll, they'll show their impact factor on their, their, um, homepage. Um, it's a a metric that most journals are really proud of really aware of and constantly working to try to improve and um 
think the other thing I wanted to touch upon too is the uh, the journey of a journal manuscript. Yeah. We talked a little bit about what that looks like for a book, and it's a little different for a journal article. And I know for me, when I started writing journal articles and submitting them, uh, I wish someone had just simply said, this is how the process goes. This is what to expect. <laughs> you know, um, if you don't hear from an editor with an X amount of time, don't worry about it. Just, you know, be patient. It's a long process. Um, things like, you know, when you submit your journal manuscript, to an editor, to the journal. Sometimes they want you to just email it to them and you'll want to be sure to read all the instructions and format it appropriately and, you know, not be over the page limit and, you know, make, read all the instructions before you submit something yeah. for sure. Some journals are going to ask you to submit to an email. Some are going to ask you to submit in an online portal that's a little more complicated. You have to create a username and a password and log in and upload things in specific ways. Sometimes they're gonna ask you to submit multiple documents, usually a cover letter that will, is basically you addressing the editor, or editors or editorial board, and you know explaining why you think your article is relevant to this journal at this point in time. Why should they publish this? And there's some really useful templates you can find just by Googling journal article cover letter. Uh -huh. um, you know, just simple. Then a title page, you know, which has your name, your affiliations, credentials, those kinds of things, the title of the article. Um, then the actual manuscript. Sometimes they want you to submit the manuscript twice, once with your name on it and once without your name on it. Mm, interesting. Because it, it makes it easier for them when they send it out for peer review. Uh, it, it, you know, they need it to be a blind, unbiased peer review, mm -hmm. which means the peer reviewer isn't supposed to know who wrote the <laughs> article. <laughs> so that's why they might ask you to submit it without your name on it. Mm. Um, and then if your publication has images or figures or tables, they're probably going to want you to submit those separate in a separate document in a specific format and not to have it within the actual text. Mm -hmm. so you want to read all the instructions for that. Um, the Once it's received by the journal, the editor will usually take a quick look at it and determine if it's worth, if, if it's relevant to the, the journal that they're publishing. If so, they'll they'll forward it and assign it to someone on the editorial board, maybe an executive editor or consulting editor, whose job then is to find two peer reviewers to review the article and send feedback back and a recommendation as whether the journal should accept the article, the manuscript for publication accept it contingent on minor or major revisions or reject the article. And like I had said earlier, some journals, you know, all journals have different processes and, and statistics related to how many articles they accept or reject. Um, you know, the peer review process is not perfect. <laughs> of course, there's they try to make it as unbiased and as objective as possible. And, you know, it's still human beings involved in reviewing and editing and making these decisions. Uh, so it's not perfect, but it, it's the, the standard for the field. Um, it's rare, very rare that you submit an, a manuscript, it goes to peer review, and they come back and say, congratulations, your article is accepted as is. I've almost never heard of that. Mm. They're almost always going to request and require revisions of some sort, either minor revisions or major ones. And think of it as a, a process of enhancing the quality, the accuracy, 
um, and the integrity of your manuscript. It can be intimidating that, you know, your peers are critiquing your work. It, it can really be intimidating and people take offense to it sometimes. But I find it helps to think of it as uh, the peer reviewers are helping me improve the integrity of the work rather than critiquing it. You know, when we write something, it often feels like our baby that we created and we have to protect. And when someone critiques it, it can, it can be intense. But this is normal part of the publishing process and, and something that, you know, we need to be open to. Maybe we didn't portray the idea in the most clear way. Or maybe we overstated the significance of the research or the data based on our own biases. Maybe we missed something. Maybe we have inaccurate information in there. Maybe we misspelled something or misquoted someone. Maybe our references are out of date. Or maybe we missed references that are also relevant to this. So the, the peer review process really helps with that. Um, it's not uncommon to go back and forth multiple times in the revision process, and it can take several months. Um, it depends on the editor that's assigned your paper. It depends on the peer reviewers assigned to your paper. It depends on your efficiency in responding to them. And it depends on the timeline for the journal's publication deadlines. Mm. I've had some manuscripts that that take a year, a year and a half from the time it's submitted to the time it's published, which is a long time to wait, especially when you're excited about an idea. Yeah. Um, and then I've had other manuscripts that are submitted and within a couple months, they're published. And it's a much what quicker. Are the, what are the rules around asking about that? Uh, you can certainly follow up and ask about it. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest giving it at least a couple months before. Mm -hmm. That's good advice. Following up. I mean, think about once you submit, it's going to take a little bit of time for the, the chief editor to look at it, to review it briefly and assign it to another editor. That might take a week or two or, or three or longer. Then that other editor, it's gonna take some time for them to review it and determine peer reviewers that would be experts in this specific content mm. and reach out to them. And I've had, I've had situations where I'm in the role of the journal editor and I'm trying to find peer reviewers and I reach out to a peer reviewer and they don't respond. Not and mm. Two months later, I realize, oh my gosh, they never responded. I still need to find another peer reviewer. This is holding up the, the progress of the manuscript now. Right. Sometimes peer reviewers are quick in their review and, and respond quickly. Sometimes they take a month or two or three or ask for dead or for extensions. And then the peer reviews have to go back to the editor and the editor sometimes adds comments and then it gets back to the author. So that, that process could take two months if you're lucky. That would be a really quick turnaround, mm. really quick. And that process could take nine months. Mm. That would be pretty slow. Um, you know, if it's been two or three months and you haven't heard anything, I think that's enough time to inquire. To politely inquire. Yeah. Um, and the the online portals for submitting manuscripts, they often include progress updates. Mm -hmm. So if you are submitting to a journal that includes that, um, you can log on to there with your credentials and it'll show you if there's any updates, it'll tell you uh, peer reviewers have been assigned to this or an editor has been assigned to it, waiting on, on peer review comments. Or you might, you might log into it and realize, oh my gosh, they sent this to me a month ago and I missed it <laughs> and they're waiting on me. <laughs> <Oops>. <laughs> yeah. So 
So uh, I think that helps to keep in mind that it, it's, it can be a long process. And, and even once it's accepted, then it goes to copy editing and, and you'll have to sign a contract with the journal. Um, there's all sorts of nuances about copyrights and about contracts with journal publishing. Uh, usually when you publish something in a journal, the journal holds the copyright to that. They own it. Sometimes it's a, a joint copyright. It really just depends on the publisher and your contract and if you negotiate on that or not. Um, and then, you know, just like with a book publication, they'll send you proofs from their editorial team. Their, their, the publishing team will send you proofs. And you'll have to make corrections and confirm that everything's right, send it back to them. Then, you know, if they publish an online issue, a lot of journals now are publishing advanced online um, manuscripts, where almost as soon as the article is finished editing and, and is accepted and the contract is signed and proofs are sent back, pretty quickly it can be published online instead of waiting for the actual issue to be published, which might be nine months later, if it's a journal that only publishes an issue once a year. Mm. So I'm seeing that more often. Um, and, and that's really useful for authors because your article is out there, you can share it, you can cite it, reference it, and it's available online and you don't have to wait for that issue to be published. Um, some journals publish four or more issues per year, and other journals might only publish one issue a year. I think the other nuance related to, to academic publishing is uh, the open access option, which is something we mentioned in, in the context of my book, which is open access. It seems that open access is becoming more and more popular and preferred. Uh, in a meeting with a, a publishing company, I, I learned that some grant funders and even some governments in Europe are requiring open access publishing, requiring it instead of traditional publishing. So the major difference is that traditional academic journal that's published is not accessible to the public. Right only accessible to folks who are subscribed to that journal or who are affiliated with a university or maybe a medical system where they have access to all the journal databases through their university or, or through their system. An open access article or book is available to anyone anywhere at any time for free. So some grant funders are requiring that their researchers and authors publish open access and, and some governments in Europe. So it seems that the field is moving towards open access. And so. yeah, it's a good idea. Um, it works really well, I'm finding, for folks who do have grants mm -hmm. and, and financial support for their work. Right. Because if you publish open access, the journal is no longer making money selling subscriptions. So the author is tasked with paying a lump sum of money in order to make it open access. Mm. And that could be for a journal article that could be anywhere from $500 to $4,000 for one article. Uh, for books, it's significantly higher too. So you know, for, so that can also happen for books. Exactly. Yep. Okay. So open access is nice in that you can get your work out there to anyone anywhere. And it makes it's it nice much, if you're funded. Yeah, it, it's nice if you're funded. It's tough if you're not. Right. Um, so when you when you are publishing in a journal, they'll usually give you the option to uh, publish open access or not. And you can explore that with them. Uh, so that's a, that's another thing to consider and, and be aware of. Looks like Ivy, 
Your dog she's there is. Very, she's getting very ready. She's very excited. <laughs> she's excited about open access publishing. Yeah, she's like, I've got funding. Let's do it. I don't. More people will be able to access this beautiful knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> that's a good point, Ivy. That's a really good point. <laughs> yeah. So, and again, I think it doesn't hurt to ask for funding if you, even if you don't have funding for your, your research or your writing. You know, I found that when I'm writing about content that relates to a treatment center I work at, when I've approached them and said, hey, I'd like to publish this open access, this if it's open access, it'll benefit you in that you can use it as a marketing tool. They might be willing to cover all or some of the open access costs. Mm, Doesn't so hurt to ask. That's an amazing tactic. So sort of if you can make your writing essentially a resource or part of the marketing for another organization, if you can align yourself in some ways, then it's it's almost like getting funding from a research institution, but just a little bit different. Exactly. Yep. Without <laughs> the uh, complicated applications and all that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the one other thing I wanted to add about journal publishing to keep in mind is that there are a growing number of predatory journals out there. And I don't know a whole lot about them, but the way that they seem to work is that once you've published an article somewhere, they seem to have like bots scanning the internet and scanning the journals and like have automated emails that are sent to you saying, dear Dr. Giacomucci, we read your fascinating article in such and such journal. <laughs> and they'll have the title of your other article and the journal it was published in and praising your work about how great it is and inviting you to submit to their journal. However, what they don't always advertise is that their journal is, requires a publishing fee and they'll charge you a couple hundred dollars or, or a couple thousand dollars to publish in the journal and some of them are open access only which isn't a bad thing in itself um, but they might not be forthcoming about if you publish in our journal the cost to publish open access is two thousand dollars for an article um, and then these predatory journals are usually not indexed in any academic databases so if you do publish with them, your article isn't going to show up anywhere. It's not going to be in search results when someone searches um, the academic databases. They might be able to find it on the journal's web page if it is open access. Uh, if the journal's website has good um, Google SEO, and you're lucky. Um, but there are definitely a growing number of predatory journals out there. You can usually spot them in that they're sending you a templated email praising your work, asking you to submit to their issue. And you can, you know, dig dig in a little bit and, and research their journal, see if they have an impact factor or not. Mm -hmm. um, what I notice is a lot of these predatory journals don't have impact factors or they haven't been in operation for very long. That would be another clue. Mm -hmm. You know, if this journal just started four years ago and it's not affiliated with any professional society, that would be a red flag. Mm -hmm. um, so definitely something to keep an eye out for and, and you know, avoid getting in a sticky situation like that. Mm -hmm. You want to make sure that your work is published in a a reputable journal. That's helpful. Yeah, do you want to say anything more about, um, you know, psychodrama specifically, and then your connection to research, like, you're entering into a field where there's not a whole lot of other research? Did that impact your, did, did it give you a sense of freedom to think like, well, Kind of a desert here or was there something that was more scary about that um i guess for me it was kind of an interesting journey coming to research which mm -hmm. was not like writing it was something i really 
wasn't warmed up to was pretty resistant to in my grad programs i wasn't at all interested in learning about research although i had to um in my doctorate program i was opening up to it more and, and definitely more interested and you know any doctorate has a large emphasis on research mm -hmm. i think it, by that point i had started to see how important it was and how necessary it was especially mm -hmm. for the psychodrama community um, most of us in the psychodrama community are more um, expressive and spontaneous and dramatic <laughs> and less um academic and research oriented yeah and in the united states most psychodramatists work in private institutes or in in direct practice roles and don't have access to research resources research support don't have research training or or simply don't have access to an irb board in a, a institutional re review board which is required in order to conduct research. Right. So one really exciting finding that just emerged a couple of weeks ago uh, in my work with the Psychodrama Journal and our, um, the, so I just, I don't know, a month ago, I was um, chosen as the new co-chief editor of the journal, uh, along with Tom. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> along with uh, Tom Treadwell, who's the other co-chief editor. And we were exploring how can we help support psychodramatists and others to engage in research. And access to an IRB board has always been a huge roadblock and limitation. Um, you know, for someone who's a full-time professor, access to an IRB board is pretty easy and simple, and, and you have it right there at the university. But for someone who doesn't have academic affiliation, it's scary, it's unknown, there's no easy access. It can be really expensive if you look into private IRB boards. They can charge several thousand dollars for a single application review. Mm. Even the, um, the health system that I'm contracted in, uh, when I inquired about doing research for the services I provide for them, they wanted to charge a couple thousand dollars for the IRB review, mm -hmm. uh, which is inaccessible for someone that doesn't have research grants and funding and that kind of right. stuff. So one thing Tom discovered is that uh, public universities, at least some of them or most of them, I don't know about all of them, but public universities allow folks who are not affiliated with them to submit IRB applications, which is a huge, huge finding. This means that if you're a practitioner and you wanna do a small research study, uh, the limitation of not having access to an IRB board isn't a limitation anymore. You can contact your local public university and inquire about submitting an application to their IRB board. Uh, private universities will not accept uh, applications from you, but public universities will. Interesting, good loophole there. Yeah, <laughs> so, so this is a, a really important finding that just a month or so ago, Tom discovered, really it was him who discovered it. And we're trying to get the word out, especially to the psychodrama community. Yeah. But I think to the, the counseling and therapy communities in general, where, you know, it's the, those of us that are practitioners, we have the most access to clients and we're the ones doing interventions and running groups and leading programs, but we usually don't have academic affiliation and IRB board access. Right. And there's, now there's an easy route to IRB access. Yeah. And it, so a, Sorry to cut you off, Ben. Okay. I was just going to say, it's important to also note that like doing an IRB board application usually feels really intimidating. Mm. <laughs> I know it did for me. And it's much easier and simpler usually than we imagine it to be. Um, so 
I do, I always encourage people not to be overly intimidated by it, you know, answering one question at a time. And before you, you know it, you're done. I was shocked at how, I mean, not that it's completely simple. Some, some parts of it are more complicated, but overall I was shocked at how simple it was compared to like the story I had made up in my mind about how <laughs> intimidating and difficult doing an IRB board application. The monsters on the other side of the screen. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think research doesn't have to be as complicated as we, as we make it out to be sometimes. Yeah, and especially with tricks like that. I mean, I think for more practitioner-based uh, authors that are coming to this, that's really helpful to hear. And, and also a great way of center, centering more vulnerable voices that wouldn't traditionally have access to publishing. So right. thank you for that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think too, just to add another little insight I found in doing research and submitting IRB applications, um, actually two two major pieces here. Yeah. One <laughs> is about um, what I found is that collecting data for program evaluation and including informed consent that you know the data in the future might be used for research purposes or marketing purposes, program evaluation. Yeah having all that data just kind of collected as a normal part of the program, you know, think of it as like patient satisfaction surveys. Yeah. Really simple measures of outcomes, pre and post tests. Um, getting IRB board approval to analyze data that was already collected for program evaluation is a lot easier and streamlined than doing a full human subjects study. So I think they call this an archival study in that you're really just applying for approval that they're signing off on, you know, your informed consent process was ethical. You're maintaining confidentiality and de-identifying the data. You know, they're looking at those kinds of things, but you're applying to access and analyze the data that's already been collected rather than applying to collect access and analyze the data. Yeah. So that's something I've found with, you know, some of the, the, the studies that I'm working on currently and the study I published in the summer, that was the route we used because we had collected the data for program evaluation initially, and it made the IRB application even simpler. It was a exempt, non-human subject study because the application was Sarah just Heibel. to analyze. Does that take away any of its credibility long term? Like, no? No. I, I mean, it prevents the, it, it limits the type of research design you could use. I mean, you can't do a randomized controlled study as right. a program evaluation and then <laughs> apply for IRB approval. That wouldn't be ethical. <laughs> but if you're literally just collecting data to explore outcomes and satisfaction sure. related to a program that already exists, mm -hmm. that's ethical. And we should be doing that anyway to explore right. how are our clients experiencing the services we're providing. We should all be collecting some sort of simple outcome data at least. Yeah. Getting into that observing ego again, but on a whole new level. <laughs> right. And and empowering our clients to have a voice and have um and to take their feedback seriously too and yeah. create program changes even when they're difficult to do. Um I found that most of the best ideas in the programs that I run came from clients. Mm. Not all of them, but many of them did. I mean, the yeah. name of my group and the name of my center came from clients proposing names. Oh. Um, a lot of the ways that I 
paste things or order things in my inpatient work came from feedback from clients about what was helpful, what wasn't helpful. Mm. Um, and as a practitioner, especially if you're working within a larger system, having data, whether it's quantitative or qualitative or both, from patients about their experience allows yeah. you to advocate for them, advocate for yourself, negotiate new contracts and, and raises even in salary. <laughs> um, it, it, it's definitely a useful tool for, for lots of things. Um, I think the other thing I wanted to say too is for folks interested in doing research who maybe weren't trained in research mm -hmm. or don't know how to do complicated statistical analyses, and, and I'm in that category, I do not know how to do any of those super complicated <laughs> data analyses. What I found was that um, most university professors are thrilled to collaborate on research projects in the community. Mm -hmm. And if you find a professor who's tenure track, who is expected to publish by their university, is expected mm -hmm. to make collaborations in the community by the university, you know, they're more than thrilled to help you out in your research projects, assuming, you know, they have the time and space to do it right. um, for free too. You know, I, I went to the university across the street from the treatment center I work at and said, hey, can I make an appointment with the guy who teaches the psychology status, psychology statistics courses? I had a meeting with him, said, hey, I run this program across the street, collected all this data. I don't know how to do an IRB application. I don't know how to analyze the data. Never done research before would you like to collaborate with me? I, I think I could really learn from you. And I think, you know, the areas that are my weaknesses are your strengths mm -hmm. and perhaps vice versa. You know, I have this program that I run and all the clients and all the data and expertise and trauma therapy and psychodrama. I think our strengths could really work well together. And, um, it was funny, he told me that the article we published helped him get promoted a year early in his professor. Oh, talk. wow. Yeah. So I guess I'm saying don't be afraid to ask for help um, and to, you know, reach out to someone at your local university who has the skills that you might not have and has the experience you might not have. You might be surprised in how willing and excited they are to collaborate with you. Yeah, and, and how symbiotic that the result of that could be for everyone if there's a spark, or it sounds like. Exactly, it really could be mutually beneficial for everyone. Yeah, could you say more about um, just any recommendations you have for practitioners looking for models of program evaluation or different methodologies they might use to assess like their own treatment centers? Yeah, so um, what I found is is really keeping it simple and more or less not trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, what I did, which I found really helpful, is choosing already validated assessment tools mm -hmm. that someone else has created that have already been uh, researched and and validated and, and deemed as as reliable yeah. for whatever issue clinically or population that I'm working with and to use those. Now you want to be sure that you have permission to use them before you use them. Some of them are out there and you can freely use them. Other ones require you to buy a license to use them, which are usually pretty cheap. Some of them require you to download a free license you want to look into that before you start using them. Um, at the, one of the programs I work at, we use the PTSD symptom checklist mm -hmm. for the, the trauma group that I facilitate. And we use it as a screening tool. So clients are completing this one page assessment um, 
upon referral to the trauma services. And it helps us in our assessment to determine if this is a good fit for them or not. And that gives us a, a pretest score. And then when they're discharging from the program, um, I give them a, a, a packet with informed consent with a, the same exact assessment, the PTSD symptom checklist, which is a post-test now that they've completed the program and include some open-ended uh, questions about their experience in the services specifically. Mm -hmm. You know, really simple things that give you more insight into, you know, how did they experience this? What was most, what was most helpful for you in this? What was least helpful? Uh, did you feel safe in the services? Um, did you find that they helped you reduce your PTSD symptoms or help you cope with or manage the trauma you experienced? So we're asking, you know, about the program itself, but also about how it's impacted them, their perception. Mm -hmm. And so having those answers, more open-ended questions, they help us make sense of the pre and post-test scores when you're writing up a research study about it. You know, it's one thing to have all this quantitative data that shows, all right, on average, the clients decreased by 25% in PTSD symptoms and not to have any other information about it. Like, why did it decrease? How did it decrease? Mm. Or which clients and in what way did it decrease? Right. Did they feel like it was decreasing as it decreased? <laughs> especially with ptsd symptoms and trauma work it's a good question <laughs> so the the more open-ended qualitative questions really can help us make sense of quantitative data yeah. and to better understand how clients are experiencing the services and how they're experiencing changes if there are any what they believe the change was related to, um, just getting more uh, of a subjective take on it. You know, what did you find is most helpful? How do you feel like this helped you? Right. Um, so in terms of program evaluation, those would be the two things I would suggest. Find some already established, validated, reliable instruments that were created by someone else that have been validated in the field and you can search for them online. Um, you, if you have access to uh, academic journals, you can find articles, research articles that use that scale and they'll have a section, um, their measure, measures section in the publication should outline your know, previous research that was done to validate that scale as reliable. Right. Because not all scales are reliable <laughs> and they're not all reliable with all populations either. Right. You know, especially if a scale is translated, you know, you want to make sure that mm -hmm. the translations are accurate. Mm -hmm. um, you want to make sure that, you know, if the same person fills out that scale, that there's some reliability um, that it's measuring what it says it's measuring. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's what I would suggest in terms of program evaluation. Um, okay. Think about it as, what tools am I already using for assessment and how can I include them as a post-test to get outcomes, outcome measures, or perhaps to begin using new tools that relate to the program you have you know if if the program's on treating addiction or depression you would want to find skills related to that if it's about self-worth or self-efficacy or self-esteem you there's tons of skills related to that you could find um if it's about trauma or ptsd there's skills related you know you got to find a scale that fits with what you're trying to measure you got to scale your scale yeah, yeah, there's a whole spectrum of scales out there. 
Great, that's uh, helpful. Yeah, I could see that really being helpful for practitioners who also might want to publish later, having established clear methods in the beginning. Yeah, and to. once you have just embedded the, those scales into your daily operations of the program, it's like, oh, I need to make, someone needs to make a referral to my group. All right, they're going to fill out this referral form and this assessment too. And it adds an extra five minutes of time, not a whole lot, quick. And it's something the client's filling out. And then, oh, oh, you're you're discharging from the program tomorrow. Here's an optional uh, uh, survey and assessment and consent form related to opting into this research study we're doing or not. Mm -hmm. uh, if you choose to do it, you can return it to this this person. And it's just kind of built into what you do. Um, you know, it, it won't even be something you really think about until it's time to analyze the data months later. You'll have all this data ready. That's great. That's so, you'll just have all this data. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It'll just be easy. That That's, no, that's awesome though. That's a beautiful tool for helping support practitioners and becoming more widely published. So thank you for that. Yeah. Great. So, you know, what I found helpful in my own journey as a writer, honestly, was starting with blog posts and um, newsletter articles, mm -hmm. which are shorter, but still professionally oriented related to the work I was doing. And, and the, like newsletters for a professional organization you're a part of, is that what you mean? Exactly. Yep. So like um, social work organization newsletters. Psychodrama, the Psychodrama Association newsletter. Um, even, you know, the smaller the organization is, the less submissions they're getting to their newsletter for articles and the more likely that, that you could publish in it probably. Mm -hmm. Especially if you're just starting out and, and maybe feeling less confident as an author. Um, I find it, found it helpful to start with um, my local Pennsylvania social work organization. Mm -hmm and submitted just a one page article that was published in their professional newsletter. And then, you know, moved on to considering a journal article after I had felt more confident having had a few short newsletter articles published. And I found that it was a really nice progression of writing like a one or two page professional newsletter article about something and then having that as a starting point to warm up to mm. a longer academic journal article on the same topic. So that's something I, I often suggest to my students who are interested in, in writing is to, you know, keep it simple and start small and then move on to the next step and the next thing and, and just gradually work your way into writing a journal article or a book. You know, for most people, maybe anyone who's written a book, they don't just write a book. It's not the first thing they've ever published. They probably have written other articles, newspaper articles, newsletter articles, blog posts, maybe journal articles before they consider writing a, a full book. Right. So I think it, it helps to uh, warm ourselves up in that way too, to, to start small yeah and work into longer more complicated and and uh publications that require a longer commitment um that that was my process that was what i found helpful yeah that's great it's helpful to hear you talk about the the process of warming up itself and then there's like the process of warming up to your career <laughs> right <laughs> and building confidence through smaller publications and one thing i didn't hear you mention is so you said blogs newsletter articles and then sort of work. but there's a few professional magazines out there like i'm thinking of like um aamft has a magazine or there are other psych i mean psychology today comes to mind some magazines that aren't necessarily 
newsy type things like they might have more narrative content personal stories almost like prose and literature um intersection right. in them too i could see that being in the um do you have any insight i guess on that that there's like a leap between journal like who you are when you write for a journal and who you are when you write for a magazine right. do you have any experience with that juxtaposition uh, that's a good question, Penn. Um, I don't have much experience other than submitting a proposal to psychology today and getting rejected. <laughs> <laughs> the learning experience. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and they have a blog too. So that's another thing where, you know, some of the, some of the magazines have blogs as well. So you can write, so you can submit, submit to both. Am I correct? Exactly. Yep. I mean, I think I think you're right in that it's a different audience, a different type of writing um, that might allow you to write in a more personal way and, right. and reflective way with less of an academic focus and less citations and jargon. Um, so it's definitely a different type of writing that's possible in magazines and blog posts and even professional newsletters. I found that although they are for professional societies, they they seem to appreciate more reflective pieces too. Right. Like more accessible, more readability. It's like something you might pick up and just thumb through and read an article really quickly or something. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think the even if we're writing about the same topic in these different types of publications it's it's back to that multilingual piece right. about translating for who the audience is i mean i i if i were to write an article for psychology today it would be more kind of pop psychology oriented and for a larger audience of therapists in addition to potential clients whereas if i'm writing a journal article it's it i know it's not at all for clients. It's really specifically for students, for professionals, for academics. Right. So definitely different type of writing. And, and I think there's value to engaging in all different types of writing and figuring out uh, where your strengths are and, and what you enjoy the most. Yeah. I think it's helpful too to consider that the type of writing that we enjoy the most the one that we're the best at mm -hmm. and the one that has the most impact in the field, they might not be the same. Mm, that's painful. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah. like for me, I, I really like writing theoretical and practice oriented articles, mm. uh, like scholarly articles for some reason, they're like my favorite kinds of writing. Though I'm coming to realize that research publications are more likely to have a larger impact on the field, mm -hmm. especially in my specialty, you know, in, in psychodrama, there's a, a lack of, of research. And so like, one research publication on psychodrama has a much larger impact than me writing a practice oriented article, which is right. still important and needs to be done. But the level of impact that they have in the field is definitely different. Right. Yeah, in my training with Dr. Leticia Nieto at St. Martin's, we often um, look at decisions through what do we want? What's the best for us, theoretically? And then what's the best for the collective? Mm. So it sounds like a similar framework to yeah i like that both of those i, I like that. that that's beautiful that's really helpful and and we should definitely give a shout out to uh to leticia uh, for all the amazing work that she's doing and and her book that she published and definitely, yeah. facilitating the connection between us we wouldn't have yeah. met probably without leticia it's true yeah Thanks, Leticia. Thank you. <laughs> um, and my the first person that introduced me to psychodrama. So that's life-changing also. Yeah.
definitely special. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this is all so helpful. I'm looking at our big list and it looks like we covered a lot of it. Um, I'm so grateful to you. And I know that my students are really excited to have more mentorship around this. Ivy's more excited about I having see. more <laughs> mentorship around this. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add just about um, writing or? I think we covered words it. words for upcoming authors? <laughs> <laughs> I think we covered most of it. I mean, just to bring it full circle, you know, writing is a, an act of creating. You're you're giving birth to something that didn't exist before. And, you know, it can feel exhausting and draining and intimidating and boring at times. But it's an exciting thing to do to, to create something, to, to think of it as art making in some ways. I love that. I think that that would be one of the most important things I'd want to uh, emphasize about writing. Yeah. That's beautiful. Well, for the record, I'm still not sick of listening to you talk about writing, <laughs> but I appreciate the question. So thank you. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Ben. I, I enjoyed this, and I hope this is helpful for uh, anyone who watches the recording. Mm -hmm.